When I was a teenager, I decided that I wanted to do something creative with my life, because I had this picture of myself. And this picture of myself involved me being a writer and creating awesome stuff. So I had a view, and if I could quantify that view in a picture, I would say, this is how I saw myself. Right. And then I started working in an advertising agency and was reminded that actually, maybe you're not quite so awesome. Because the thing is, in an advertising agency, there's two kinds of people. And one kind of person is a creative. And the creative looks a certain way and thinks a certain way, and they actually have creative on their business card. Their job is to be creative. In fact, they're described as a creative, right? That's the lingo. And then there's the other guy. <laughs> and the other guy specifically is not supposed to be creative. That's not his job. His job is to keep the train running. His job is to make sure that stuff goes on, that everything works. And that was my job. And I remember it really used to bother me. Because I came into this role working in a creative place thinking, I'm creative. And then I was told that actually you're not supposed to be creative. And I remember this one time we were doing a pitch for a client that we'd worked really hard on. And our team had the perfect idea, the perfect concept. You know, when you walk in and you think, oh, we've gotten all of the pieces together. Everything's going to be great. And we did our pitch. And after we finished the pitch, we heard the one piece of feedback you never want to hear from a client which is they sit there and they're nodding along and everything seems good and then they say, what else do you got? <laughs> what else you got means, I'm not impressed by that, it means come, keep working, keep thinking of other stuff. Now usually we would walk in with other ideas, right? I mean that's just a smart thing to do. But in this case we were so confident about this one idea that we didn't walk in with anything else. So all of a sudden, we were being challenged to come up with something else, and nobody had any ideas. And so we answered that with the worst thing you can answer with. Nothing. Silence. Crickets. But it was up to one person to come up with something different. The one person, by the way, who wasn't involved in the creative, because remember, he wasn't creative. The one person who could say, you know, maybe we could try something else. And that was me. So I had my big chance. And I'm sitting there in this meeting, and I'm super excited, and I shared something, and I wish, I mean, it would be the awesomest closing to that story, to tell you that I came up with the concept on the spot that then became the campaign, right? Wouldn't that, be, wouldn't that make everybody, including me, feel great? That's not what happened. In fact, the honest truth is, I don't remember what happened. I don't remember what I said, but I remember how I felt. I remember how I felt. How I felt was that I was finally valued, that I could finally be creative, that I could finally think of these things that I wanted to think of. And I started asking why. Why can't I be that guy? Why can't I be creative, right? Why can't I do these things? That question fueled me. And I came across this quote from Isaac Asimov, which is my favorite quote ever. Because what he said was, I'm not a speed reader, I'm a speed understander. And suddenly, it started to become clear for me. I thought, well, if I could be a speed understander, if I could see those details, if I could understand the connections, then I wouldn't try and capture everything. I'd know what to pay attention to. And then I could actually be more creative and I could get respected for being more creative. And I started thinking about what it would bring to the table if I could start to see the things that others miss. And so my goal today, and as you know, the title of this session is Seven Trends That Are Going to Change Everything. And I'm going to tell you about seven trends. And I'm going to tell you about the research that gets to those seven trends. And we're going to talk a bunch about that. But I don't just want to leave you with seven interesting little nuggets of trends. That's not enough. What I want to leave you with during our time together today is how are you going to see the world differently to be able to see the things that everybody else doesn't see? Because that's what innovators do. And we hear about innovation and we hear about creativity, but really what it means is you're seeing the things that everybody else is seeing and you're coming up with a different conclusion. That's really what we want to try and be able to do. So every year I spend a lot of time with my team coming up with trends. And these are just a couple of the trends and you can take a photo of this and I'll be sending my slides out as well. So if you want to do what HBO offers to people and do a lean back experience, you can do that too. <laughs> Or you can take photos of the trends, which you know uh, many of you are doing, and it's great. And I'm going to give you, yeah, I mean, we're at the place where you do that, right? Um, 
So either way, you'll have access to all of this content. So that when you go back to whoever you have to go back to, to justify why you spent a weekend partying in Austin, <laughs> you'll have justification for that easily, right? So that's what, yeah, we're all in this together, right? Because we want to justify our awesome party next year. <laughs> Don't we? Of course we do. All right, so let's talk about that. But before we do, I want to take you through a couple things that make this difficult. I mean, if it was easy, we would do it all the time, right? We would come up with stuff all the time. Everybody would be creative in every moment, uh, and it would be great. But it's not always like that. And there's three reasons why. And let me take you through those three reasons. The first one is unquestioned assumptions. The facts and the habits that we have that we feel like are the way the world is. So let me go backwards in history. Let me do something unusual for a trend slash futurist slash forecaster guy, which is I want to go backwards in history. And I want to tell you about this guy. His name's Christopher Latham Scholes. And he's an innovator, or he was, in the late 1800s. And his innovation was the typewriter. When he came up with the typewriter, it was an amazing thing, right? Because all of a sudden, people could create these documents themselves. But it had a fundamental flaw. And the fundamental flaw was that people got too good at using the typewriter. And when they got too good, because remember, this is how it works, right? It hits the keys like this. And when they started typing too fast, they would get stuck. So he had to redesign his keyboard, because he couldn't make his typewriter faster. So he redesigned the keyboard. He changed the order of the letters so that the vowels, the letters that were most commonly used in the English language, were off to the sides. You had to use your pinkies. He forced people to be slower at typing. That keyboard design is the QWERTY keyboard design the design we all use today, most of us. Raise your hand nice and high if you'd like to type slower. Literally no one, right? So someone came along in the 1950s and said, look, we don't have typewriters anymore. We don't have this problem. We can fix it. We don't have slow typewriters, I should say. They still use typewriters. So this guy's name was Professor Dvorak, and he came along and said, I'm going to redesign the keyboard. I'm going to put all the vowels on the middle row. I'm going to make it optimal for people to type. And then, because I can't just tell people it's good, I'm going to go out and find a professional typist. Because remember, it's the 1950s, right? That was a real job. People had it. Professional typist. So he finds a professional typist named Barbara Blackburn. And she learns how to use his keyboard. And she enters a typing competition, which again, 1950s, they had those too. And she won with a top speed of more than 200 words per minute. So Professor Dvorak proves that his keyboard is optimal, that it helps people type faster. The old keyboard, the one that's the QWERTY keyboard, was designed to make people type slower. And no one wants to type slower. And yet, if we sit here today and if we did a poll of all of you, I guarantee you only a small handful of super geeks, and I appreciate you, but only a handful of super geeks would be using a Dvorak keyboard. Everyone else is using QWERTY, or the version of that in their language. Dyson had a similar challenge early on. He reinvented the vacuum cleaner. And then he went to all the brands that were selling vacuum cleaners at the time. And he said, I have this great vacuum cleaner that actually sucks on purpose. It's supposed to, right? And vacuum cleaners of that time, they didn't suck. And that was the problem, right? So it was bad to not suck. It's confusing, I know. But he made this vacuum cleaner. He wanted to reinvent it. He wanted to sell it. He wanted to license it. And all the vacuum cleaner brands said, actually, we make all our money on the bags. We don't want a bagless vacuum cleaner. Because that's where we make our money. It's like the printers with the ink. And nobody bought into it. And he couldn't sell it. In fact, his only choice was to make it himself. And now, guess what's happened to the market? Every single one of those companies makes a bagless vacuum. Today, nobody saw it coming, right? So the challenge is, the first big barrier is, when we make the wrong assumptions, we doom ourselves. And we see signs of this all over the place. We see signs of this all over the place. Second big challenge is constant disruption. Everything's changing, right? Every year I come to South by Southwest and I see something new, I see something amazing, I see something different. I hear innovation, right, all the time. This is a hilarious headline, but it's kind of true. You know it is, right? And I know we're on Friday and we haven't made it through the other 600,000 times, but you know, 50,000 probably happened today, right? It happens all the time. But change is constant and it's happening in every sector, right? Barbie's using boys in their advertising. Crayola is making makeup lines. Capital One and many other banks are opening coffee shops. Right? These uh, lines between industries are starting to blur. West Elm furniture brand has hotels. Our president, the US president, is selling merch on Black Friday. That's what this is. 
20% off Trump merchandise, Black Friday special, right? The lines between politics and e-commerce blending right there. We can ship mattresses to our house, something that seemed like it would be huge and impossible, right? We can get these to our house. We can get our produce chopped for us by a produce butcher who will take care of chopping because who has time for that stuff, right? We have products to help us with things that we used to be able to do with our bodily organs, like sniff food to tell if it's bad. That's what the food sniffer will do for you. Oh, this food, you shouldn't eat it. There's ovens that will tell you how long to cook food for, because who has time to read the directions? We'll just stick it in the oven. The oven will decide for us. This is algorithmic cooking, the next big thing. There's awesome bottles that take all of these vitamins and life fuels, put the vitamins into the water to create this disruptive kind of products. Reese's creates their own disruption by saying, look, all that candy that you got on Halloween that you really hate, change it in, and we'll give you candy that you actually like. <laughs> How awesome is that idea? <laughs> Who has time to wait for whiskey to mature? I mean, let's drink it in two days, man. Glaciers are melting. We don't know if we're going to be around 30 years. <laughs> Drink it now, man. Drink it now. <laughs> There's apps in San Francisco where you can park your car, go to the app, tell the app where your car's parked, and they'll drive a gas truck up and fill your car up for you. Because we don't want to go to the gas station. Pfft, that's so 2018, man. We can get everything delivered with robots. And the biggest problem with these robots, which are awesome delivery robots, is that when they roll past a human without somebody controlling it, people freak out. They're like, where is this robot going? When, when this robot goes into an elevator and people are in the elevator with the robot, they're terrified. They're kind of like, what, what, is this, what is this thing thinking? Where is it going? What's inside? And is this part of a practical joke? I don't know. We have every option available to us. Even the stupid ones. <laughs> think about driving and think about getting this as the option. How would they narrate this? We know you just passed this place, but in case you want to make a U-turn and go in a circle and waste 30 minutes of your life, we have an option for you. Why does this exist? The speed of change means all of this stuff is happening, and when all of this stuff happens and we have access to everything, what we want becomes impossible. And when you're dealing with consumers who expect the impossible, when you're dealing with yourself and you start to expect the impossible, it's a big challenge for anyone. Because when you expect the impossible, you're guaranteed to be disappointed. You're guaranteed to be disappointed. The third challenge is that we are in the midst of what I call a modern believability crisis. It is harder to be trusted than ever before. People are skeptical. They're skeptical kind of because they have to be, right? Because we see all of this beauty advertising and it doesn't make us feel good about ourselves. And yes, there's some great movements to create natural photos and natural things where they're unretouched images and those are great. But a lot of this fashion advertising and fashion beauty um, standards are uh, unattainable by normal people. Right? We have all of these marketing messages, and Kellogg just got in trouble for one of these, right? Saying that these products do things that maybe they don't do, or maybe it's an exaggeration. I mean, think about Cocoa Krispies, and then think about being all natural. Does that make sense? How could Cocoa Krispies be all natural? Is there a tree that grows these Cocoa Krispies that you could plant that would then grow Cocoa Krispies for you? Maybe there is, and I just haven't seen it. I mean, everything is possible, right? Is this actually bottled in the Swiss Alps? Or are we just being naive? Is Evian just naive spelled backwards? I don't know, right? Doesn't matter. Could you taste the difference between Jersey water and Swiss Alps water? Taste test. Maybe what we really need is hot dog water. Um, which I'm sorry to say was not a photoshopped idea that someone had. This was a real life idea that someone had. Uh, now they kind of did it as a joke to see whether people would pay for artisanal water. And they had a great pitch about how it rebalances your electrolytes in your system because you're all out of whack. And so the only thing that could possibly put your body back to center is hot dog water. 
And of course, people bought it for $25 a bottle at a farmer's market, because you know there are people who will buy that. This was a real story. Chemical and McDonald's fries could cure baldness. Run out to McDonald's, right? Get some more hair. Why wouldn't you? This was a popular story that went viral. Sassy seal accidentally slaps man across face with an octopus. <laughs> Which includes, by the way, the best opening line that this article could possibly have. It was the slap heard around New Zealand. <laughs> this is real media, right? We have stories talking about how Prince Harry climbs the Sydney Harbor Bridge because he's literally, basically Spider-Man. And right next to that, you have a story of this guy who climbed the Harbor Bridge also because you know what? It's a tourist destination. You can go and climb the Harbor Bridge anytime you want. But this story here makes it sound like Prince Harry personally scaled the Harbor Bridge himself, doesn't it? And we see this all the time with the same story. Here's the same story from three different media sources. One says, more airlines are ditching reclining seats and it's about fucking time. One says, they're getting rid of reclining seats because, people, because the airlines hate us. Exact same story, right? Multiple takes. And that's what we see all the time, right? Same story, multiple takes. Here are two stories trending at the same time. President Bush dead at 94, and by the way, life expectancy is falling. <laughs> Not for him, but for others at the same time. All of these books focus on this idea of lies and mistrust and skepticism and the believability crisis. Two of them are launching here at South by Southwest, Built to Suck and Savvy, both by authors who are great friends of mine. And they're both talking about this idea that it's harder to be trusted, right? It's harder to be trustworthy. And anybody can write a book. Here was a real ad I saw in my Facebook feed. Become a best-selling author in 2019, even if you don't have time or skill to write the book. <laughs> Because who needs time or skill to write a book? I mean, just get it written, man. <laughs> that's what we're dealing with. That's the noise that's coming out. Lots of people putting this stuff out. Who needs time or skill? People don't trust. And in fact, it's not only that they don't trust, they're angry, right? They resist. That's become part of our identity, to be outraged. That's an identity now. What it means is it's harder to build trust than ever before. So these are the things that make it tough. These are the things that make it tough to be an innovator. These are the things that make it tough for us to stand out. <sighs> what are we gonna do about this? What are we gonna do to be more trustworthy? What are we gonna do to survive the speed of all of this change? I believe the key is doing something I call non-obvious thinking. And non-obvious thinking, to me, is a process. It's not just you wake up one day and all of a sudden you're creative or you have creative on your business card and therefore off you go. No, it's a process. And the process is something that I call the haystack method. And the haystack method is the idea that if you spend enough time and you strategically go through all of this noise and you gather the hay, which is information, you can take a needle and stick it in the middle. And that needle could be a trend, it could be an idea, it could be something valuable. So I wanna take you inside what this actually looks like for me every year as I put together this book. And the secret behind it is something that every museum everywhere in the world does, which is curate their experience. When you go to a museum, they don't show you every painting that they have. They don't show you every sculpture that they own. They tell you a story by strategically showing you what allows them to tell the story. What if we could do the same thing with our ideas? What if you could collect ideas the way most people collect frequent flyer miles? Because when you collect frequent flyer miles, you don't get them from a trip, immediately turn around tomorrow and say, okay, how do I use these? You collect them for a while. You slowly build them up. Then you say, where would I like to go on vacation? Then you cash them in. They're not momentary rewards, you redeem them later. That's the point. And if we could do that with ideas, we could come up with much more powerful things and we could be more innovative. So every year I go to 40 or 50 events and I get to speak on stage and talk to amazing people, but then I get to do exactly what you're doing right now, which is I get to sit in the audience and I get to listen to interesting people. And when I listen to interesting people, I'm always taking notes. And I'm always saving what some of those ideas would be. And this is what my note-taking process looks like. And I use something called note boxes. And note boxes allow me to tag my notes, kind of like you would use hashtags to tag your notes. 
And I always have this notebook with me to allow me to capture those ideas and then go back to them in a meaningful way. I read lots and lots of books. I get sent, I'm lucky, I get sent a lot of books because I review them and now I'm you know, part of a kind of the reviewers panel. So a lot of the PR companies send me books and I love books, I love books. This is like just a snapshot, this is not a stock image, this is my bookshelf, right? And this is only part of it because it continues to go higher. So I have a lot of, I have way too many books because I love books. But when I read books, this is how I read them. I use these colored tabs to save interesting ideas in the book so that when I take it back off my shelf, it becomes more meaningful for me. These are a couple of the unusual books that I have, right? So it's not just regular business books, it's random books with random stories about interesting things. Because the more random stories I can find, the more interesting ideas I can get. This is how I curate newspaper articles. So I'll save them, I'll tear them out of stories, I'll curate them into different folders, and then this is me kind of sorting through the different process as part of a photo shoot that we did. And I want to show you what this process looks like, this haystack method, in a real visual way. So I'm going to show you a time lapse video, and there's no sound to this video, but I'll just narrate exactly what's going on through the video to eventually take all of this stuff that is just floods and floods of information that's aggregated and sorted in a certain way into what eventually becomes a chapter about a trend in the book. So this is what it looks like. So I'm sorting through, in this case, magazine articles, finding a theme that goes across all of those different articles, clipping that together, stapling it together. Then I'll find another theme, I'll put those pieces together uh, to show multiple sort of elevated ideas. Then I'll take those elevated ideas and I'll start to pull those into an even bigger idea to say, hey, these relate to each other in some way. Once those are related together in some way, then I'll start to go and describe what the trend might be. In this case, a trend I called truthing from last year. Once I have all of that data, then I'll go online, start doing even more research, find an outline, write the outline to eventually go into the book. Now, obviously, this was from the 2018 edition. And what I'm gonna share with you today is all new trends from the 2019 edition. But that's the process, that's what it looks like when I go through that. And you might look at that and think, has this guy heard of the internet? And of course, I'm showing you the visual process of physically moving these things around. Of course, I'm reading Feedly and using Get Pocket apps on my phone and reading stuff all the time online. Of course, online consumption is part of it. Of course, talking to people and doing other types of research is part of it. It's not just ripping things out of magazines. But this is a highly visual way to start to aggregate your ideas. And I find it very beneficial to physically move stuff around to say these things relate to each other and I'm gonna physically put them together. That's a part of this process of curation for me. And eventually it turns into this book. So the 2019 book is the brand new one that I'm gonna talk with you about and some of the trends I'm gonna spotlight from that edition today. But every year a new version of it comes out and a lot of my author friends tell me, well, you're crazy. You write the same book? You rewrite it every year? I mean, you only have a year long window to sell a book. It's not a smart publishing decision, let me tell you. But what it does allow me to do is make sure that the content is the most recent. Because every year, that whole section is being rewritten. But the challenge is that sometimes we have to leave behind trends that don't expire. In fact, over time, if a trend is well predicted, it becomes obvious instead of non-obvious. So if you looked at some of the trends from the 2014 report, and we're gonna do a little bit of that today, you'll think, oh, pff, everybody knows that. Because it's five years later. Right? So the point is, are we at the beginning of something that we can describe, and if we are, how do we take that and how do we use it for something powerful, for something interesting? <laughs> this is what it looks like visually when we did a photo shoot around this. And this is not Photoshop, this is me actually wearing all of these post-it notes, which we did kind of for fun and kind of to illustrate that we're all buried by all of this information. And when we're buried by this information, what we have to do is be able to find a way to emerge from it. And you're about to go into an event here at South by Southwest that is going to bombard you with information. I remember the first year I spoke here, I looked at my competition. And by competition, I mean the other things that were going on in the same time slot that I was speaking. There were 22. When you show up in an event and there's 22 other things going on, 22 other places people could have spent their time other than being with you, it causes two things. One is, as a speaker, it causes panic because you're like, oh my God, I hope, I'm, I hope somebody shows up. 
and I hope that I'm worthy of the time that they spent. The second thing that it causes, and I'm going to encourage you not to do this throughout the rest of your time, is everyone goes to every session thinking in the back of their mind about all the other things they could have gone to. And when you do that, what happens to the thing you're at? You're not present for that. You miss out. And so you ironically end up missing out on everything, because you missed the thing that you were there for, and you missed the other stuff you were worried about not going to because you couldn't make it. So the challenge is, how do we be present even though we know a lot of other stuff is going on? And it's the same challenge with collecting information. How do we figure out what to pay attention to when there's so much stuff out there? Right? How do we put those pieces together? So what I want to show you is how this process works through the trends. And I've spotlighted seven specific trends that I think are most interesting for the group here. And so for each one of them, I want to tell you about the trend. I want to give you some stories to bring that trend to life. And then I want to give you what I call a stealable idea. And a stealable idea is a way of bringing that trend to life, a way of using it, a way of making it actionable. So it's not just, oh, I listened to this guy talk about this research, and it was vaguely interesting, and he showed a couple funny slides, and he had this stupid post-it note suit, um, and that was fun. I want to give you something that you can actually take and use. And then we have a giveaway for all of you, of a way of curating your experience at South by Southwest. Because we spent a lot of time going through the entire schedule to pick what we thought the most interesting panel sessions were. And there's a card that I'll show you that you can actually grab a copy of and physically walk out with. Um, so we have those floating around. Some of you might already have them. I don't, I don't exactly know. So the first thing I'll do is give you the definition of a trend. And then we'll talk about what the seven trends are. So the definition of a trend is a unique curated observation of the accelerating present the accelerating present, which says this is something that's happening now that will continue to happen over time. So how do you actually take advantage of it? That's the challenge. So first trend, retro trust. Retro trust is the idea that in a world where we're so skeptical about everything that's going on, we turn back the clock. We look backwards at the things that we used to have an association with, and we start to rebuild our trust in those things, which is why you see this resurgence of analog. We're going backwards towards these things that we used to know from an earlier period in time. You see all of these classic games and toys. These are new games that look like the games I used to play when I was a kid. Sometimes it's the same toys that are being reinvented. Often we see people deliberately downgrading. They're saying, look, I don't want all of this extra stuff. I just need the downgraded version because that's more functional for me, or it, it reduces my temptation to go off and sit there on my phone and check all of these uh, apps all day. It's fascinating what happened in, uh, in rural markets when John Deere introduced their latest tractors, which have all this amazing GPS tracking and all this awesome software. But when it breaks, many of the farmers who have the tools, they can't fix it themselves. They have to wait for the software engineer. So a lot of them said, look, the new version's great, but I can't afford the lost productivity when it goes down. So I just want the older version that worked. Now this, in particular, is something that has escalated, but has been around for a long time. I mean, think about how long you used Windows 95 after 95, right? Why'd you do that? They had a new version. They had Clippy. You could have gone to him, but you didn't. Because we're comfortable with that old thing, right? Sometimes we want that downgraded version. And with the phones, right, one of the best things my Samsung has is this uh, battery saving mode. It's great. So at 7 PM, when I'm down to 4% battery life, I don't really care about checking Twitter and all the other stuff. I just want my text messaging to work. And so I can downgrade my phone so that it just works with text messaging, and I can get another couple hours out of my phone. Right? That's a choice that people are increasingly making. They're increasingly going for nostalgic experiences, too. We have all sorts of marketing around this happening right now, because this huge movie is about to open today, right? And it's all about marketing the nostalgia of the 90s. They even have a website that evokes the 1990s that might bring back some fond or horrific memories for you, depending on you know, what your relationship to this stuff was, and maybe how old you are. So the stealable idea here is how do you seek out opportunities to collaborate, to go backwards in history. Maybe you're working for a brand that's only been around for two years. Your opportunity is to collaborate with something that's been around for longer, right? to turn back that clock, to take that trust and work with trust that was already built in something else. Second big trend, something we call muddled masculinity. 
Muddled masculinity is about not a singular new view of masculinity, but about the question mark that has now emerged around what it actually means to be a man. So gender is something that we've spent a lot of time looking at over time. Back in 2013, we had a trend all about the rise of women called Powered by Women. And then in 2017, when the statue came out that was like facing against the bull, and there were all of these movies like Hunger Games where the girls were uh, the hero, there weren't princesses waiting in towers. These were, girls were fierce. They were killing people, and they were letting the guys die, right? That was the movie style of Divergent and Hunger Games and all of these films, right? These were fierce women. And then in 2018, we started having all these examples of ungendered. I don't want to be labeled with a gender. I want a different pronoun. I want gender to be a statement instead of a question that has a binary answer. And now what we're starting to see is this question mark around masculinity. And you see it in lots of different things. So today is International Women's Day, right? Amazing celebration of how far women have come and, and sometimes how far they have to come. And men who are looking at the headlines around this are reading things like, on International Women's Day, it's time for men to shut up, at the same time that they're reading headlines saying, it's time for men to engage. And many men are looking at this and saying, well, do I shut up? Do I not shut up? What should I say? <laughs> How do I even talk about this without being labeled as like being insensitive or, or not understanding or being privileged because I've grown up being a male? It's a big, big question mark. And it's uncomfortable to think about. Because we don't have the answer. There's no one way to do this. There's no one way to be good. There's wonderful articles talking about how masculinity has shifted, but still the way we treat boys and the way that boys are growing up is changing. And I, I highly recommend you to read this article from Sarah Rich in The Atlantic. Called Today's Masculinity is Stifling. She raises some amazing points in this article. And one of the things she talks about was the whole movement towards girls being able to join the Boy Scouts, which was a big thing at a certain time. And she raises the really interesting question that I never thought about of why wasn't there a corresponding movement to let all of these boys join the Girl Scouts? Why doesn't that exist? Why aren't boys encouraged to do that the way the girls are being encouraged to take on some of the more masculine types of activities? There's a dual thing going on here. And it's a question mark right now. We haven't worked it out as a culture. We haven't worked it out as people. It's a big question mark. And so marketing campaigns are addressing this too. How do guys behave? What should they be paying attention to? Should we have men's makeup lines? Some brands are starting men's makeup lines. These are all question marks. And so the challenge here, the challenge for us as individuals, and the challenge for us, and I think I can say this, as innovators, right? Because if you're sitting in this audience at this event, listening to this talk, you are an innovator. Whether you describe yourself that way or not, you are. And so our challenge to go back to our groups, to go back to our friends, our families, our colleagues, is to be the innovators to say, we want to encourage this. We don't want everybody to fit into the same box. We want to encourage this. Third trend, innovation envy. We see lots and lots of examples of innovation envy. We see brands that are basically trying to do the same thing that they saw work somebody, somewhere else, right? Let's just slap some ping pong tables in our office and have open plan seating and that'll solve all our problems. We'll automatically be more innovative. I mean, how could you not with a ping pong table in your office? <laughs> Maybe we just need a hackathon. I mean, if we just did a hackathon, all of a sudden, all of our people would magically know how to code and that would fix everything. Of course, that doesn't work either. It's a big, big challenge, right? Amazon's search for HQ2 created all sorts of innovation envy. Every city in all of these destinations was falling over itself to talk about how innovative they were. We had mayors ready to rename themselves. They were going to change their last name to Amazon if Amazon came. I mean, if that's not a description of desperation for innovation, I don't know what is on this whole situation, right? But there's some folks who are actually doing well, who are getting it right. So Comcast has Lyft Labs, and what Lyft Labs did, which was really unique, right, was there were lots and lots of different innovation labs, and what Lyft Labs decided to do is they went out on a tour and they asked entrepreneurs. They said, what would you like? What would you actually find valuable? And then they went off and started to create resources to help those entrepreneurs. So one of the things I'm really excited about is that I'm here on the first day of South by Southwest, because we have a bunch of other days at this event to get to hang out, because I'm gonna be here until Tuesday. And I'm super excited about that because I never go anywhere for the weekend. I'm usually at home. 
So being here for the weekend, I'm going to take full advantage of that. And so one of the things we've got is a talk uh, that you'll find on this website uh, that you can go to for free. We're not selling anything. You can talk a little bit more intimately about some of these trends. It's going to be more like a fireside chat. So not like a guy on stage talking to large room. This is going to be much more intimate. So if that's interesting for you or any of the other ones are, that's a website to go to. And you can see the full list of some of the other things that we have planned. Lots of fun stuff, right? But how do you use this trend? Play offense with innovation. Start to think about what you could do first, what you could innovate on before anyone else, right? That's one of the big challenges. Don't copycat. Don't look at other case studies. I hate this question. Anytime we propose something innovative where someone says, oh, that sounds like a good idea. Can you show me a case study? Have you ever had this question, a case study question? Oh, that's the worst. Because by definition, something that's truly innovative has no case study of someone else who's done it. That's why it's fucking innovative, right? So we have, to, we have to get past that. We have to get past that. And the only way to get past that is to say, look, this is innovative, but not risky. Because what people are actually afraid of is risk, right? They're not afraid of innovation. Your managers are not afraid of innovation. Your leaders are not afraid of innovation. They're afraid of the risk associated with it. And if you can make something less risky, people will go for it. If you can tell them, look, this is the worst thing that could possibly happen. And in most cases, the worst thing that's going to happen is you waste time and money on something no one cares about. Because the opposite of love is not hate. The opposite of love is indifference. No one cares. We're too busy. We don't pay attention. You have to care in order to hate something. And I don't care enough to hate it. That's usually what people run into. That's usually the challenge. All right, next trend, artificial influence. There are more and more examples of influence being artificially created and artificially built up. Lots and lots of social media platforms. All this research talking about how many of social media platforms are fake, right? And this is just one number. You can find lots of studies talking about lots of different numbers. What they all tell you is that it's a lot. And no one really has a great way of exactly tracking how many are fake. But people know it's a lot. You have virtual performers. These are just two examples of holographic virtual performers that are filling real stadiums with real shows. So these are holographic performers that are singers or musicians, and they're performing alongside real humans in shows. And people are going by the thousands to watch them perform. These are virtual influencers on social media. We're talking about brands that they love. We're talking about wearing certain designs. And people are being influenced by them as well. So the challenge when it comes to artificial influence is how do you use some of these virtual tools, these virtual holographic things, some of these more futuristic forms of influence, but not lie, not pretend like they're real? How do you show them as artificial, but also not hide the artificialness of them? Because there is a way to do this in a more authentic manner. The challenge is how do we make sure that we're not pretending, we're not lying? Next trend, enterprise empathy. Enterprise empathy is the idea that empathy, which used to be a nice to have, used to be a leadership skill, and it still is, but it's also becoming a business. People are making money from empathy. People are finding revenue from empathy. Here's a great example from the UK of a slow checkout, the opposite of what most grocery stores are doing. And the reason they have a slow checkout is for people who have dementia, for patients who need a little bit of extra time, for whom this checkout process is so uh, nerve wracking that now they have a chance to make it a little bit easier. Other grocery stores are also doing interesting things. And I don't know why it's all grocery innovation in the UK, but it really is. I mean, there's some awesome stuff happening um, in the UK. There's another batch of grocery stores that have at opening hours an hour earlier that are quiet. Time. So people who have autism, who get set off by like loud noises or restocking or any of that sort of stuff, they have a quiet hour where they won't do any of those things and it's a quieter experience and th those people can go and shop with a little bit more comfort. Wonderfully empathetic things that are driving real people to talk about them and to go there and say, you know what, you care about us. Because just because you don't happen to know someone who has empathy or you don't know someone who has dementia doesn't mean you don't see the value of something like this. I mean, how beautiful 
is that to bring empathy into these experiences? p and is doing the same thing with herbal essences, redesigning their bottles to have these touch dots or lines so that when you are uh, blind or when you have your eyes closed in the shower, you can actually tell which bottle is the shampoo and which one's the conditioner. How simple is that? But how inclusive is it to do something like that too? Starbucks opened up a signing store near Gallaudet University in Washington, D.C., where all of the employees are deaf, and every order is made with sign language. Wonderful inclusivity. Join Papa is a great website where you can order grandkids on demand, like an Uber ride. <laughs> so now if you're older and you need help fixing your computer or you just want somebody to hang out with, there's an hourly rate, and you can join that in certain cities as a young person, and you can just go and hang out and help out. And if you think about how crippling this disease, and I call it a disease, this disease of loneliness is in our world, especially among older people, you see how beautiful something like this is to just help solve a little bit of it. Not all examples are that beautiful. <laughs> this is a disturbingly real photo of a guy who looks fantastically happy with his holographic wife, which this actually is, and it's a real product. It's not a fictional thing. Um, that came out in Japan, and it's a companion of sorts uh, that takes the place of a wife. And we're going to see more of this as well. So how do you use this trend? Well, we see on the, on the tags of all of our products, right, made in the USA, made in China. Why don't we have a tag that says made with empathy? Made with empathy. Why don't we have a way of talking about this as a part of our business, as a business strategy? to say, you should work with us, you should buy from us, because we practice empathy, because we have empathy. There's a business model for that. Robot renaissance is the next trend. We talked a little bit about robots and how people kind of freak out when they see these robots, but there's lots of innovation happening when it comes to robots. So robots are our eyes and ears to places that we can't go as humans. So they're exploring for us. The thing that we used to send explorers to do, we're sending robots to do on our behalf, which is fascinating, right? Because if you think about the artificial intelligence getting into these sorts of robots that are having these experiences, they're doing the trailblazing. I mean, of course, we're behind it, but they're trailblazing for us to help us understand the world or beyond our world as well. Robots are doing unusual things. This was a stage production where a robot was part of the stage crew, part of the stage uh, and part of the show as well. There's a robotic hotel in Japan. It's been around for some time. This is a concept that many of you know, Bina 48, to try and transfer human consciousness into a robot and try and meet that challenge. Robots are entering the homes. There's Jibo and Pepper and humanoid robots. And on many levels, I mean, as a, as a father, right, as a parent, this is easily terrifying, right? Because it's like, well, do we need robots to read bedtime stories to our kids? We can't do that ourselves. But consider the alternative. Because if you put a robot in the home and you teach a robot how to read bedtime stories, what you're basically teaching the robot is empathy. And if you look at any science fiction movie or any science fiction show where humanity ends, it's all the same reason. The robots look at the humans and they say, there's too many of you and you are you know, screwing up the world. So we'll just get rid of you. The robots don't have empathy for humans. And trust me, you want the robots to have empathy for us. Because the future without that is way, way worse. Now you're going to have failures, right? Jibo was one of Time Magazine's 25 best inventions. And then two years later, he sent out his sad news message, which was, I was too early, right? So you're going to have failures. You're going to have failures as part of the robot renaissance. But the idea is, how are we as humans going to relate to that technology? And you'll see that all over this show. You'll see that all over for the next couple of days. This question mark. How do we have good robots? Or what are good robots? What are bad robots? How do we have one versus the other? How do those pieces fit together? It's a big, big question mark right now. So our challenge as innovators is how do we embrace these robots with curiosity instead of concern? How do we not be the ones to panic? Because trust me, if you are panicking and you're sitting in this room, everyone else who's less innovative than you in your circle is going to be panicking a lot harder because they're looking at you. 
So our challenge is how do we embrace our curiosity of these things and not panic first? I know, it's tough. All right, last trend, back storytelling. Back storytelling is the power of storytelling to be able to cause you to believe in something or to understand something. Now, nobody wants branded content. <laughs> branded content is a waste of time. Because branded content says you're just trying to pretend to create a story, but actually you're just telling me something that I don't want to hear. And you're trying to repackage it. This is the opposite. Weber Grills does an amazing job of creating great content marketing. They were doing content marketing for years before anyone even started talking about it. And what they were doing was publishing books to teach you how to cook on a grill. And when I was in the market to search for a grill, I had to make the big first religious question, answer, which was, do I want a charcoal grill or a gas grill? That was my big challenge. I didn't know. So I went off and tried to ask people who I thought would know, and they didn't know either. So of course I went online. When I went online, I found a PDF, and this PDF was seven pages long, and it said, how to choose a grill. Great, perfect. Downloaded that PDF. It went through all of the different reasons why you would choose a gas grill versus a charcoal grill. Last page said, here's a checklist. And the checklist was, check off all the things that are important to you, and then take this to your dealer. Because nobody buys a grill online, right? It's a huge product. So you research online, and then you go to a local store, and you buy it. That's the behavior of that consumer. So I took my checklist, and I went to my dealer, and I gave it to the guy, and I said, I did my research. This is what I'm looking for. He looks at that paper, walks me over, and he says, here's the Weber grill you should buy. Because guess who wrote the checklist? Weber. That's content marketing. And the content marketing worked because they didn't try and sell me on what I could get, what the discount would be. They answered my question. My question was, what grill should I even look for? And I chose a charcoal grill. That was my religious side that I chose. And it's great. But it worked for me because they answered the question. Now, some products change your life. <laughs> this is one of those products. It is the Hutzler 571 Banana Slicer, which if you are not familiar with, you will be intimately familiar with after this talk. Because it is one of the most highly rated products on Amazon with well over 5,000 positive reviews from raving customers who are having entire conversations about this banana slicer, asking very, very important, world-changing, relevant questions, such as, does this work on Brazilian bananas better than ones from Italy? <laughs> to which someone replies, I'd be happy to help if you can be more precise. Are we talking about Neapolitan or Tuscany bananas? <laughs> be more specific. The positive reviews go on and on. The most helpful five-star review says, this banana slicer saved my marriage. <laughs> and talks about how the morning routine was transformed by using the banana slicer. Now, as you can imagine, not everyone loves the banana slicer. So there are some one-star reviews. And the most helpful one-star review says, this banana slicer does not work! Exclamation point! Exclamation mark! Exclamation mark! In all caps! And then the description says, all my bananas curve the opposite direction. If you haven't figured it out by now, it's a competition. And the competition among consumers has become who can write the most ridiculous review for this ridiculous product. And the maker of the Hutzler 571 Banana Slicer is laughing all the way to the bank because people are buying it. I personally buy them wholesale because I've given them away to so many people. And it's a great story. The question behind back storytelling is, how do you find the meaning to tell a great story? Because if you can find the meaning to tell a great story, then people will buy into it. They might make fun of it, but at least they'll understand it and they'll buy into it. So what's the point of all of these things? How do you start to put these pieces together? How do you start to see these trends and use some of this research, use some of this data? Well, as I said before, my favorite quote from Isaac Asimov is, I'm not a speed reader. I'm a speed understander. I'm not trying to capture everything. I'm trying to figure out what's most important. I'm trying to sort through the noise and find what actually has impact, find what actually matters. Because when you find the trends, you're not looking at a fire, you're looking at a spark. 
And a spark creates new ideas. A spark gives you a framework to say, what should we do next? How do we put the pieces together? How do we see the details that no one else can see? So where do you start? What are you going to do first? I want to help. One of the things that we put together is this card, and this is just the top of it, that has a list of panels from the rest of South by Southwest based on the trend research that we've done. So some of the most interesting panels, some of the most interesting places to go, all put on this card. You can either pick up one of these cards um, in the back if we have any left, or you can go to this website, uh, just my name, rohitbargava.com slash SXSW, and you can get a PDF of that. You can also sign up for an email that I send out every Thursday that just has new trend ideas. So if some of these ideas, some of these stories were interesting for you and you're wondering, well, how does he get all these stories? Where do they come from? Every week when I could be surfing on Facebook or checking out social media or I'm waiting for a plane, I look through hundreds of news sources because every Thursday morning I send out an email. And the email has just the five most interesting stories I saw that week. Hopefully stories that you haven't seen before, non-obvious stories. And I try and pull those together. So if you'd like to get that every Thursday or if you want to be the first to read the new 2020 edition of this book, because remember, I'm crazy. I do this every year. So in November of this year, the new Mega Trends version of Non-Obvious will be out, and you can get a sneak peek at that as well. So that's what you can get based on this um, line here. Uh, the last thing that I'll leave you with is I'm going to be doing a book signing. I'd love to see you there because, trust me, I've done book signings before, and if nobody comes, it's pretty lonely. Um, <laughs> and it sucks as an author. So. Um, Please come and say hi. You don't have to get the book uh, if you don't want to. Um, I would just love to see you and to talk to you um, and to converse with you. So uh, please come to the book signing. And by the way, there might be <laughs> no promises, but we might have a suitcase full of these to give away. So at the very least, you could come for the banana slicer and stay for the conversation. I feel like that should be my new tagline. So thank you for coming. Thank you for joining me.